Okay, a very warm welcome to all of you. This is week five of seven of the Python level one course. If you're joining this for the first time, you know that there are four other videos that come before that and there's some prep material that you could watch to help you set up and get started. But today we'll be looking at, as the title of the video says, we'll be looking at if, for, and while statements. Um, the Python Level 1 course, if you have not come across this before, is a way for you to get a good foundation in Python programming. Once you have a good foundation, you can do virtually anything. And, and that's the aim, I hope, is that you can build this nice foundation, because everything else depends on this. As we shall see today, when we talk about these constructs, there are certain fundamentals that repeat throughout. And having a good grasp of these fundamentals is, a, is really, really important. The thing is that programming is a practical skill. It's not just knowledge, it's practical. You take the ideas from programming and you go out and apply them. And so this course is designed so that you can actually practice. So there's a lot of problems available for you to work through if you sign up for the course and you can develop that skill and build it. Some of the problems will be challenging as we shall mention but that's how you, you know, build that muscle. This is something, if you've never done programming before, you'll find some of the ideas very strange. But once you take the time to practice and work on them, you, you, it's like you open up a new vista in your mind. And, and my hope is that you can begin to enjoy this. So let's get started. We'll start by talking about last week's work. Now, my understanding or what has come to me is that... Um, the prog programming challenges for week four were quite challenging. Now, there was a big change between the programming tasks for week three and before and week, uh, and week four. In week four, my goal is to try and get you thinking in terms of applied uh, applications and so that you, you, you see how the data structures that we have, dictionary sets, lists, are not just nice things that you could you know, you, you read about and you say that this is how a dictionary works. You have to then apply them to a problem. And making that transition from the purely abstract data structures to a real-world problem where you're processing strings, where you're processing numbers, where you're sorting things and running for loops and if statements, that begins to activate some muscles that you've never used before. Um, and... You, 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 the more you do these problems, the easier they become. And each of the problems is designed to introduce a new idea so that you, you are spreading in different directions. So if you found them challenging, it's because those are muscles that you've never used before. And by engaging in those challenges, you, 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 will, you will get to build strength. And the second thing is that uh, you can pick five of 10 um, if you want, at least, um, and then I would, for the tutored students, I'd give you feedback on that. But obviously, I would encourage you to try and do all of them if you can, uh, because they, they'll just really, really help you to have a good, good grasp of what you can do with a dictionary and to help you think, start thinking abstractly. Uh, once we get to the, you know, the level two course where we'll be talking about classes, your ability at, at abstraction needs to be so much stronger. So these are skills that you will get better and better with over time. Okay, that's it for week four. If you have any questions, you can always email me, get in touch with me through the class. And um, you all have my email, so you could get in touch with me. So let's talk about this week's material. So this week, we are going to talk about if, for, and while statements, or they're also called constructs. Before we go into that, let's just have a bit of background of, of, to help us have a nice foundation to, to begin to study this. Now, if, for, and while are what we call compound statements, we've already seen one example of a compound statement, and that's a try-except blocks. In a try-except block, you have the try part where you try to do something, and you have an exception handler, which begins with accept and the name of the exception. Uh, we saw this, uh, I think we saw this the week before. This was week uh, two, I think. 
or week three, yeah, week three, we were looking at uh, list tuples and exceptions. And with one of the distinguishing factors about these blocks is that you'll usually have some code that's indented and we'll see what the names of that are. Today we're looking at the if, for, and the while constructs. And these are perhaps the most important if you are writing declarative code, which is code which will run from one point to the other and following, certain, following the instructions that you've laid down. Next week, we're going to look at death. And if you remember from week one, death is how we define functions. Um, in all the programs you've been writing as part of the programming challenges, I've asked you to make sure that they follow a certain structure. And that structure always has a main function. It begins with death. So next week, we're going to look at that in detail. And we'll look at a lot of things about functions. We'll learn how to write functions, about function arguments, and, and the return values, and many, many other things. So we'll get into that next week. And in the last week, we're going to look at the with construct. It's called a context handler. With is used, we will use it in the context of files. Um, and this is a really handy, it's not exclusively used for files, but you can, you can use it for many other things, but we're going to use it in that context because it does something nice for us. So that's it about compound statements. These are the compound statements that we cover in this, in this course. Now, the thing about compound statements is they have a structure. And this is the generic structure for a compound statement. A compound statement is made up of two main parts. I know you see three colors there, but if you understand what the indents are, you know that that is not code. A compound statement has got two parts, a header and a suite. The header is the one that distinguishes one suite from another. And the header is the one that affects how the suite is executed. Now, the suite is any Python code. So you can have another compound statement inside the suite, which will have its own header in suite. But the suite is where you'd have variables. You shall do assignments. You can have if statements. You can do computations using operations. You can construct lists and dictionaries and everything you want in the suite. The suite is just anything that can be written in Python, including more compound structures, including what we cover in Python level two, the classes, everything you want can be included in the suite. So let's just say the suite is Python, but the header is a specific set of words with specific roles. And we shall see how the header changes between the different um, uh, uh, compound statements we shall be looking at today. So let's begin with an if statement. Now, an if statement is designed for conditional expression. Whenever you have an if statement, the suite will conditionally be executed. The conditional execution will depend on the evaluation of what's called an assignment expression, which I've abbreviated there, up there to assign expr. So this is a structure of a if statement, you have the literal if, which is a keyword. Then you have an assignment expression, which we shall talk about in the next slide. And then we have a colon. It must be terminated by a colon. If you don't have a colon, you get a syntax error. And then you have the suite. Now the suite will be, as we said, any valid Python, including more if statements. We can have more if statements. Okay. What is the assignment expression? In order for the suite to be executed, your assignment expression must evaluate to a Boolean with a value of true. Now, if it evaluates to false, the suite will never be executed. So keep in mind that with an if statement, we say it's conditional, the suite is only executed if the assignment expression evaluates to true. Now, it's called an assignment expression for a particular reason and we will see that as one of the quizzes so when you try out the quizzes there's an ex explanation why it's called assignment expression so i'll encourage you to do that once you get to that what can we have as an assignment expression so remember we said that an assignment expression must evaluate to a boolean and particularly a, val a value of true if you want it to execute the suite so these are conditionals. We looked at conditionals in our second class. 
And these are statements like what you have there. X is not equals to 10. Now, we don't know what X is. X could be anything. But provided it is not equals to 10, that's when you evaluate to true, then the suite will, is, going to, is going to be processed. It's going to be executed. You can also put integers. And with integers, these are the rules. If you have a value of 0, it evaluates to false. So take, for example, you have x. And if x was equals to 0, and you said if x, then it will be it will be false. If it, if it is false, then the suite will not be executed. And if it is non-zero, including if it is negative, so if it's minus 37, if it is plus 68, then it will evaluate true. With iterators, when I talk of iterators, I'm talking about strings and lists and dictionaries and tuples and sets. We use the length in the same way we use the integers. So if the iterator is empty, it has a length of zero, that evaluates to false. And if it has something inside, then it evaluates to true and the suite will be executed. And then we have a special one, none. If you ever have none as the, the value of a signed expression, and this could be because of a function, it could be because of a variable, none evaluates to false. But it is important to distinguish, sometimes it's better to make an explicit check to see if the value is none, and you use that using is none. So if x is none, then you can execute it, and x um, is, is, is not none, then you would not execute. But remember the key idea here, let me just go back one slide to make sure that I make this um, clear, is that you, the, if the assignment expression must evaluate to true in order for the suite to be executed. Okay. Now, let's look at some examples. And for these examples, I'm going to switch over to PyCharm in order for you to um, see the actual code running. So let's switch over to PyCharm. And I have PyCharm here. Okay, so we're going to run, I have a bunch of statements here that I've written out. And um, we'll start off, a, these examples are exactly like what we have in the slides. So you can look at the slides later on and you'll be able to make sense out of what's happening. So this is an example of a very simple if statement. It's simple because we only have if. So let me uncomment this code. So we have x, which is, we ask the user for a value of x. We convert that value of x into an integer, and then we check if the value is greater than 10. Now, what I could do is I could add additional, I could just add a print here to, to check if x is 10. So print, uh, sorry, sorry, f, um, what, what value do I get? x, um, let me do it literally so that you could see x is greater than 10 and we'll see whether it evaluates to x is greater than 10. So that we know when our, our section is, um, our suite is executed. So this is an if statement here. Our assignment expression here is x is greater than 10. And our, our suite here consists of only one line, print x 10. So let's run that. If we run that, what do we see? Well, it asks us for the value of x. And I could give you the value of 3. Now 3 is less than 10. So we know that that should evaluate to false. And if that's the case, we shouldn't expect to see x greater than 10 printed out, except line 8 there. And that's what we see. We don't see anything else. We only see line 8 printing out x is greater than 10 being false. Since it was false, our suite will not be executed. Now let's run it again. At this time, let's run it with a value that is... Um, greater than 10. So if I give it the value of 27, then now it does evaluate because our assignment expression of x greater than 10 evaluates to true, and then we see our x greater than 10. That's a simple if statement. Now let's go to something slightly more complicated, and this is the second example um, here. So in this second example, we have and else included. So I'm going to uncomment this. 
So the whole idea of when you have if and else, if and else means you have now two parts. The assignment expression we said it must evaluate to true, but else will be executed when the assignment expression evaluates to false. So let's just write that explicitly here. The assignment expression evaluates to false. And again, so in this case, we, we, will, we should expect to see that x is less than or equal to 10. So let's run that. And if we run that, we, let's put the value of 3. The value of 3 is less than 10. We expect to see x is less than or equal to 10. And that's exactly what we see. Um, and if we run it again, and now we give it to the value of 8, 288, now we see the value of x is greater than 10. Now, these examples look so simple, and that's because if and else statements are that simple, the complexity would come in what your assignment expression is. So it's entirely up to you to decide what your assignment expression is. But this is, this is everything you need to know about if statement. There's an if, literal if, assignment expression, and then you have the colon, and then you'd have your suite. If you have an else, you'll have a second suite which will be executed if the assignment expression evaluates to false. Okay, so that's an example where you have if and else. If you're coming from a prog another programming language like C, C++ or JavaScript, I don't know if they have this in Java, but there's something called a switch. Now, the application of in, in the, with the if-else statement, you only have a, a branch of two. You can either go to the right or you can go to the left. But suppose you wanted to go, you had, you want to have multiple directions you could go in. Or suppose you want to evaluate multiple assignment expressions. What do you do? Well, that's where the L-if statement comes in. And this works like, as I said, the switch, where you can check multiple things. Because, but but Python is soon adding a switch statement um, in in the I think version three dot ten or three dot eleven is going to have the switch statement. So let's look at what's happening here. An elif is like um, an if. It's only that it must come after an if. You can't start a statement with an an, an if elif. You have to start with the if. If will be the first one. So let's just make that explicit there. Let's say uh, cannot elif cannot be the at the beginning. Uh, must come after after an if. Okay. So you start off with an if, and we do the evaluation of x greater than ten. If x is greater than ten, that's what we print. But we might want to check another condition. Um, we want to check whether x is less than 10. So in this case, we do a check. x is less than 10. And then we print uh, another. So we print x is less than 10. And then we, for all other cases, there's only one other case. So here, only one other case. And that is, that is if x is equal to 10. x is equal to 10. Therefore, we print that. So let me clean this up. And... If we run that, we ask for, we know that one of these lines will be executed. So if I say 4, is 4 greater than 10? No. Is 4 less than 10? Yes. Then we'll see x is less than 10. If we run it with x is equals to 10, then we expect the last one. And if x is greater than 10, 22, then we see that one. Now there's a subtlety here. In this example, what I have shown is a case where we have exhausted the choices. It's very easy to come up with an example where you have not exhausted all the choices. So for example, let's, let's do something simple. Yeah, suppose we said um, we ask the user for a letter. Okay, So the, the, the user is supposed to enter a letter, in, uh, pick a letter, and they're supposed to type that there. Now, we, what are the number of options when, when it comes to a letter? Well, there are any number of letters that you could pick from A to Z. So suppose we said if 
letter is equals to a and and to make it more so let's do this let's let's do it this way um let's so print you um let's just write the letter itself a instead of writing too much and then we say else print f um i don't know what that is okay suppose this was an example okay so this should be letter uh, oh let's make it a literal a okay. so i uncomment this here it will be here and what i'm trying to illustrate here is the idea of exhaustiveness exhaustiveness okay let's clean that up okay now let's run that it's going to ask us to pick a letter and i say a and we it gives us a we're not surprised at that um so let's let's run it now with what if I gave it the letter capital A? So I don't know what this that is. Um should have been nice if we recognize that A is the same as A. So we're going to fix that by just making a change here. We'll say this, we'll move it to lower. We'll change the letter to lower. So regardless of what case you use. Okay, let's run that again with capital A. And now it knows that we picked a name. However, what are the number of options? Well, there's any number of options. You could now say else elif letter dot lower is equal to b print b now you could keep doing this all the way up to z but the point i want to make here is you want to make sure that when you have if elif and else statements you try and exhaust the possibilities in our case maybe we are only applying a and b Okay, but in some cases, what happens? So, for example, if you let, let let's look at an, let me let me write a silly example. So, let me just put a comment here saying that um, um, you might need to include um, C to Z. Okay, and once you do that, then you can you'll be able to catch this last part because the else will be for any situation that is not included. So, right now, if you run it the way it was and we put the letter Z. It'll say, I don't know what that is. And that's clear. But if you're dealing with things like numbers where you had, like, um, what values can x take? So x is equals to int input x. And then you said, if x is less than, I'm trying to think of an example where you can, if x is less than 10, uh, this is not a good example. Uh, I, I wanted to illustrate that there are sometimes you might have it usually happens whenever you are instantiating variables where you have an if and an else and where you you don't exhaust the possible values then PyCharm will throw you an error but the key important thing let me just get rid of this but the key thing you need to keep in mind let's just put this here key is ensure that your if elif else are exhaustive for your application. You'll, you'll understand this once you begin writing uh, code with problems. So I won't give an example of that, but this illustrates that you've covered A, you've covered B, you haven't covered C to Z, but C to Z will be caught here. Now, if you covered C to Z, then if you enter a number, then the number would now be caught here because A to Z are also covered. So exhaustiveness is important. But that doesn't take away from the simplicity of an if statement. It's just got if sweet, elif, uh, if um, assignment expression, elif assignment expression, as many elifs as you need, make sure it's exhaustive, and then finally have an else for cases where which are not covered in your, your if elif statements. So that's it for, I think that's it for if statements. Do we have any questions? Are we clear? Okay then. Yes. Good. Let's move on to something else now. So I will. Okay. So let's get back to the slides and and let's continue. So we have looked at this example here, where we have um, if and else, and then we looked at this example, which has got if elif. Okay. 
And these are all in the code and, and you have a few notes there. So I'm going to push this um, at the end of the class. So that was it for if statement. It's a compound structure with the header being if assignment expression column. And that's it. Let's look at a for statement now. Now for statement, again, exactly the same structure. You have a header and a suite. The only difference, of course, is that now we have our header is structured. It's got the literal for, then you have a variable, then you have a literal in, and then you have an iterator. And then you end that with a, a colon. And again, the suite can be any valid Python, including more for loops. Now, if you have multiple fours, we usually call them a nested nested for because it is nested inside you could have if statements and absolutely anything you want as long as it's valid python it will be included what's the point of four statements well four statements are loops and they will loop as many times as it can get a variable from the iterator a good example of an iterator is a list or or like the range statement <clears throat> So if you have a, a range 10, range 10 means you've got, you have the integers 0 up to 9. Therefore, when you say for variable, it's going to create a var it's going to assign to the variable. Each time through the iteration, it will assign one of the values and it will go in steps from the beginning of the iterator to the end. Range 10 has 10 integers. So var will, each time in the loop, take on the value 0, 1, up to 9. So var becomes something you can then reference inside your suite. And that's the, the key idea behind a for statement. It's a way in which it gives you some variable that you can use in the suite, which this variable changes each time depending on what you have in your iterator. It will be the value of each value inside the iterator. Um, so let's look at what iterators you support. Well, it supports lists and tuples, dictionaries, strings, ranges, and anything which is iterable. This is not an exhaustive list, but this is just to indicate, at least from what we have learned so far, the kind of things you can use as the iterator. Now, var can be an atom or a tuple. We're going to see an example of each, and then we'll make it concrete. You can apply certain functions to the iterator. So you can sort the iterator. You can perform the run the function enumerate on the iterator. You could run reverse on the iterator, though um, from one of the exercises in the quiz, you'll find out the right way to do this. Um, the quiz actually and the programming challenges have got a question on using list.reverse. But you have, the point is that you, you can modify how the items in the iterator are. So sorted, as you expect, we'll sort them out. Enumerate does something special. You're going to discover this in one of the programming challenges. I'm going to leave that for you to discover. And let's look at some examples. So this is, uh, oh, yes, there are special keywords that go with for loops. And these will also go with while loops, as we shall see. We have a special keyword, continue. And the word continue says, what it means is, if we were in the for loop and we were going through it and we encounter a continue, usually you'll find a continue in the context of an if statement. So if something is true, then you'll say continue. Whenever you see continue, it means do not continue with the, do not, do not proceed with the rest of the suite, just skip to the next value. So if we had a for loop which was going through the values 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 9, and let's say go to the, the value where the variable is equals to 4, and at 4, it then hit a continue, it will immediately skip to 5. It will go to 5 and begin the next um, travel through the suite. In, in complete opposition to that is the idea of break, when you, whenever you hit the word break, it means end the for loop immediately. So if you're going through 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and we hit break, it will exit the for loop. And it will then proceed to the next line 
after the for loop. So this is outside the suite. Typically, this will be um, an outdented, so dedented. If it's indented one level in the for loop, then it will go back now to the level of the for. We're going to see examples of each of these. Okay then, so this is the simplest example and let's switch to PyCharm and run these. So, so here we have the simplest four that you can ever have. We have range, which gives us 10 values. Now, remember that range is not a list. You can make it into a list if you want, but it's not a list. And the beautiful thing about range object is that they are they help you save on memory. So you don't have to have the full list. If you had range 1 million, range 1 million doesn't create 1 million values in memory. What it does is it will, so sorry, I'm not showing you the display. Okay then. Yeah, so, so this is, um, this is the, the for statement. So we have range. So what I was saying is if you have 1 million, 1 million values, you have range 1 million, it doesn't take 1 million, um, times as big as range one, uh, because it just produces one number at a time. Um, and now i here is our variable, which is available to be used inside our for loop. And what we expect it to do is each time it will print the value of, of i with that string. Okay, so let's run that, and that's what we get there. So this is like your basic, most basic for loop, i0 up to i9. Okay, so this is so simple because we've actually seen this before. In, in last week, I, I asked you to try out with um, different, with, to solve some of those problems using for loops. So I, that part, I think you understand quite well. But let's look at something slightly less straightforward. Now, if you recall, one of the things you could do when creating a dictionary is you could use zip. Now, um, here we are going to take range 10 and we're going to take range 9 to minus 1 in steps of minus 1. If you recall from playing around with range, we'll see what this actually does. And that creates a dictionary. So we're going to, let's print that out. So print out D. I'll, I'll comment this first of all so that we can see what that prints. So that prints out that dictionary which has got 0, 9, 1, 8, 2, 7, 3, 6, 4, um, 4, 5. I'm going to change this. I want it to actually... Do I want it that way? No, 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 no. I want it to start at 10, and I want it to end at 0. Yeah, and let's do that. Yeah, that's much better. 0, 10, 1, 9, 2, 8, 3, 5, 4, 6, 5, 5, 6, 4, and so on. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to use a dictionary has got a method called items. And what items does is if we if we print items, print d dot items, and we run that, it produces a dict items, and this dict items has a list of tuples. So this tuples is 0, 10 up to 9, 1. So if we say for i j in D items, it will then unpack each value of the tuple into separate variables. Now, we could put them into one variable and then refer to them using indices, but it's much better to have each of them have its own name because then you can do things with them independently. And then it saves you, saves on a lot of typing. All we know is that I is going to be the key and j is going to be the value. And we could use k, v, we could use anything we want. But here we just use i and j. And if we run that, so let's run that now. That's what we see. We see 0, 10, 1, 9, and so forth. So this is an example in which your variable is a container, a little container which has multiple values. And what you could do is you could unpack the container. Obviously, you want to make sure that when you're doing unpacking, that all the items in the iterator have the same size. If you have a list of tuples and some of them have two, some of them have three, then that's it's not uniform and you can't do unpacking. Well, you can do unpacking. It requires more syntax, but it's not clean. In that case, it might be better to just unpack everything into one 
variable. So let's then look at an example of. So here we've looked at, we've looked at how to do the unpacking. So this is exactly like what you have, but now let's look at an example of using continue. And as we said, continue does a skip. So I'll comment that out. As before, we've created our dictionary. Our dictionary has got uh, those values as before, so we're not going to print them out. But now we're going to do something interesting. Now we're going to check each of our values and we are going to compare the values of i and j. If we find that the values of i and j are equal, we're going to say, let's skip this one and let's see the effect of that. We'll compare this to how it behaves when you have a break. So if we run that, so we see 0, 10, 1, 9, 2, 8, 3, 7. In all these cases, i and j are not equal. And then 4, 6. So 6, 4, 7, 3, 8, 2, 9, 1. Now, if you notice, there's some numbers that are missing there. And we have a, we have a skip there. We're missing 5 and 5. So what happened was, when i was equals to j, which was when 5, i and j was 5 and j was 5, we said continue. We didn't come out of the loop. We continued in the loop. And that's what the else did. This could also work if you, if you didn't this. So in this case, so if we hit that and we run it again, we get exactly the same thing. The point is that once it gets to this continue, it doesn't read any code beyond this. So let's just write that there. Um, um, no code below will be run. Okay, so it will go immediately now to the next, the next time it's in the loop, where i and j are now six and four, and that's what you have there. So six and four. So you you see this pattern of where you have if else can be replaced with if, and then just the statement. That can happen if you have a continue because we know the continue is taking us back to the beginning. Or if you have a return statement in here. Anything that prevents code from below running, you can skip having the else. But you, you, you'll see that in practice over time. But let me just return it to what it was so that it can be nice and clean and simple. So we have if and else. So that's how continue works. So now let's look at... Um, the last example, which will have break. So in the last example, we'll see exactly the same code, but only that this time we are going to use break. So same as before, and let's run that. Now we see we go zero up to 10, one, nine, two, eight, three, seven, four, six. We get to five, five break. We immediately leave the four. And we can check that, we can print a statement here and say uh, for um, exited, so that we know that this is, if we run that again, it's immediately it tells us for exited there. And that's just a comment. And the, so now you can see the distinction between continue and break. Continue will continue in the loop and break uh, will end the loop immediately. If you look at the, the class notes to, for today, which will be available from 10 o'clock, You'll notice that a for statement actually has, you can add an else. This is something, I don't know when this was added in Python. Now just, let's look at an example of that. So we have, uh, so, so for else. And the whole idea of else, so this is a key idea. Else will always, uh, will be executed after. Um, the for, provided there is no break in the for, okay? So for i in range 10, it's a simple example, and we're going to print i, I'll comment this out. So we print i like that, and then we're going to add an else print for, for loop is done. 
So if we run this now, we will see for loop is done. Okay. So we'll, we'll, as long as we don't have a break, there's no break in here, the, the else will be executed. Let's, so let's, so let's see what happens if we have a break. So, if, so let's start with the continue. So if i is equals to 5, let's say continue. So if we run with with that, now we, we see that we skip 5. We skip 5, but we still have 4 loop is done. What if we replace it with break? So I'll leave that there. And I say I put break. And if we run that, so it will break. I is equal to 5. It will break, but we will not execute the else. So, so um, else not executed. Um, and here, else executed. So that's how you would use a for else. I would avoid using a for else for now. Just the vanilla for is good enough. But I just needed you to know that syntactically it's possible to have this so that you can have an example um, when you look at the notes. Okay. So I think that's, that's it for four statements. Do you have any questions on four statements before we go into while? Or is it crystal clear? Okay then, let's move on. So, while statement. Now, a while statement, as you would expect, is it has the same structure it's a, as before, a compound statement. But its header looks as follows. It has got the reserved words, the keywords, while. And then you have an assignment expression exactly as we had for the for statement, for the if statement. And then we end that with a colon. Otherwise, we get a syntax error. And then you have a suite. Now, a while statement behaves like a for statement in, in, in that it is a loop. Okay? A for statement loops over an iterator. A while statement loops as long as the assignment expression evaluates to true. And this typically is why we say that a for loop is it's a definite loop which we know the number of times we're going to loop while a while loop is indefinite in other words you have no idea in advance how many times you're going to loop as provided that your assignment expression evaluates to true each time the suite is executed the while loop will execute forever and in fact you can write a while loop which runs forever by saying while and then true that will execute forever provided you have no break inside um, and that's that's usually a way in which um, when you're starting out writing while loops you'll find that you're going to write um, infinite loops <laughs> by mistake because you forget to make a change inside so let's look at some of the details about while statement as you said the assignment expression must evaluate to a boolean and specifically it must evaluate to a true if we want the suite to be executed they're going to loop as long as the assignment expression is true or until we exit it. Now, something that I should mention here is it is up to you to make a modification to the assignment expression within the suite. So inside the suite, there has to be a line that changes something about the assignment expression or that does an explicit exit. As we've seen with the for statement, we exit using break, and that's exactly the same here. Assignment expressions, exactly the same as with the if statement. We have conditionals, x is not equal to 10, x is equal to 10, x is greater than 10. We'll see some examples in the next few slides. With integers again, zero, false, non-zero is true. Iterators, we use a length just like with the integers, and none evaluates to false. So here's an example, and let's go back to PyCharm to look at the actual examples. So I'll switch my display again. Um, so let's look at while statements. So we start off with a very simple one here. I say simple, but it takes a while to understand while. I know it took, it took me a while to understand while. 
But the, the thing about while, whiles are handy because they allow you to write certain algorithms that you can't write with a four because you don't know how, how many times you need to loop. The looping is tied to what's happening in the suite. <coughs> so in this case, our assignment expression is based on the value of i. So we have to have set a, the value, some value to i in advance. We start off with i being zero. And then we want to check whether the value of i is less than 10. As long as this as evaluates to true, let's just write that. As long as this is true, we loop. What does our loop do? It simply prints i is equals to i. And as I said, we then have to modify the value of i so that at some point we can exit from the, the, the loop. And in this case, we do it by incrementing the value of i. Since we are doing a comparison of whether i is less than, then i should be increasing. So whenever you see i less than, then you know that you should be adding. Maybe I should add that here. <clears throat> whenever um, the assignment has less than or equal to, so but it has less than in it, then we have to add. Then i has to be incremented. i has to be incremented. We can do it in the in the reverse, but ag again we'd have to start with our value of i would be big growing to small. Okay, so let's run that and see what that does. So what it simply does is it prints out the value of i. Eventually, it gets to have a value of ten. And you know what? We can actually print out what the value of i is outside here. So print um, the value of i after a while is. So you see, what happened was, it started off with i0, it printed it, and then it modified it so that at the end of this, the value of i was now 1. Then it compared, what is the value of i compared to 10? Is it less than 10? And that still evaluates to true. So it prints it again, and it keeps doing that until it gets to the value of 9. So let's imagine we are here. So it has just printed, the, it has just gotten the value of i and set it to 9. So i is less than 9, that's true. And then we print i is equals to 9, and then it increments i. So you see, it will increment the value of i, and i will change once we get out of the loop. But now when it compares i, it will say i is i less than 10, when it turns out i is not less than 10, that's false, and it's not going to execute the suite anymore. And it comes out, and then we will now print the value of i. Since we incremented it for it to turn out to be false, we see the last value that it had before um, it, it exited the loop. And so we see the value of i after it's 10. So that is your simplest. We could do it in reverse. Let me just do this quickly. So let's do this in reverse. We start off with i is equals to 10. So we actually already have it at i is equals to 10. So let me not even do that. So let's say while i is greater than 0. And this time, let's put equality. We're going to print um, f i is equals to i. And then we are going to uh, modify it. But now, since we are comparing, as I said, whenever the assignment expression is greater than i has to be incremented, we do the opposite. Whenever the assignment expression has got less than sign, um, in this case, we have um, so when it's less than, we increment. When it is greater than, we decrease, we decrement. So i minus equals to 1. Uh, actually, we could do something interesting. We could use 2. We don't have to use 1. Um, and we could run that. And so what we'll see is that it will start off as 10, which is what it was here. And then it will be 10. And then it will decrease by 2 to 8, 6, 4. Eventually, it will get to 0. When it is 0, it will still execute it. And let's see what the value is after here. So we print f value of i after a while. I. And if we run that, it tells us the value is actually minus 2. We know that minus 2 is not greater than 0. And therefore, it will exit the loop. So that's just an extra one that I thought I would add. So this is we are doing this in reverse. 
reverse looping. Okay, sort of looping, I'll say looping. Okay. Okay, so that's that's it on the basic use of while. So now let's look at something where we had our modification is slightly different. We're going to work with a container. So in this case, we have a list. Our list has 10 values. And we are going to use the list in the assignment expression. So let's see what that list looks like. First, we're going to print uh, my list. So our list is a very simple list, 0 up to 9. Then we are going to evaluate as we said before, whenever you have, this is going to be treated as an in, as with integers, we, we evaluate the length, evaluate the length, um, and such that zero is false, and a non-zero, so not equal to zero, evaluates to true, okay? So anything, whether it's positive or negative, it will be evaluated to true. Now, what do we expect to see? First of all, look at how, uh, so we are printing my list minus one. What do we expect that to do? That's printing the last value. And then we say pop. Now, what does pop do? Pop removes the last item. So we are showing the last item and then we remove it. So we know that our list will be changing in length as we go through the, the, the loop. Let's run that. That's what we get. So we see our list. We will print the last value, the next value, the next value until the list is empty. And we could actually print here now, let's say the print um, the length of my list is, we could put the value there, length of my list. And we see that it eventually decrements until it is zero. So it starts off, the length is, so it started off as 10. We don't see that because the pop happened before. We can put it before so that we see what that, what that does. So it's, when we started off, the length was 10. And then, uh, so we printed 9, and then we saw the length was 10. And then we print 8, and then the length is 9, until eventually the length is we know that the length is one, and then we pop. So when we pop and the length is one, we end up with an empty list. And then we, once we have an empty list, it's even evaluated as false and we exit the list. So we can print out my list here again. And we'll see that my list is actually empty. So there we have modified it. Okay, so that's while with a container and the container here is a simple list. Now. Can we do this with a tuple? What do you expect? Tuples are immutable. We can't. We can't pop from a tuple. But you can create a new tuple by excluding some values so that the new tuple will be less. Though, yeah, you probably, no, I don't think. Well, you can reassign to a new tuple and have it be the same name. So it should be possible to do that provided you keep the name of the tuple the same. The name of the tuple in line 24. Okay, so let's look at an example where we use continue. Okay, so um, I need to I think I'm mix up this code. Now this has a number of very important uh, illustrations here. That uh, let me just realign this code first. Uh, uh, okay, that, that should be correct now. That should run. So as before. We have we set i to be zero. Now again we said because we have less than we do plus. So just just remember that direction. So less than implies uh, implies we're going to do plus. It's just a mnemonic something. You once you remember this, then you know that uh, you will never get them wrong. But, but but eventually you'll understand what's going on. We are comparing in our assignment expression whether i is less than ten, which means somewhere we we should have an increment, and that's the one here. We adjust i and then skip. When i is equals to five, we are specifically going to continue. But this is a, the key key points you have to understand here. 
even if we are going to continue, we still have to modify the value of i because if we don't, we'll just keep staying at that value of i. Keep staying at that value of i and we'll never change. i will always be 5. Let's, let's actually see how that looks like. It, in fact, I should print the value of i. Let's say print skipping i. Okay. And if we run this, it's going to be really ugly, but you'll just keep seeing skipping i, skipping i, skipping i. It will never stop and we'll have to terminate it manually. So we have to do a keyboard interrupt. So even if we have a continue, we must also remember that we have to include the decrement or increment or the modification there. If it's a list, we have to do the pop. If it's a dictionary, we have to do, do something that modifies it so that your assignment expression can eventually change. If you forget that, it will just keep on looping forever. So let's run it now and let's see what we get. Aha. Ah, this is interesting. So notice it says skipping 6 when the value was 5. Do you know why? Well, it's because we added after. So we should, we should put this before the decrement so that we can see that identity. There we go. So i is 0, i is 1. When we get to 5, we, we will just do a skip. So we say skipping. We increment i so that we know eventually we shall get to our goal of changing the assignment expression. And we say continue. So we don't print out that statement. And then we go around again. And then at the end, after we've printed each value, we also have to increment. So the key, key thing about while loops is the suite must do one of two things. Modify the the value of something on the assignment expression, in our case here it is i, or explicitly break, and that's what we are moving on to right now. So let's look at an example with a break. So in this example, we have a list, okay, um, this is formatted badly, let me just clean it up. So in this example here, we have a list with 10. Again, we're using very simple list. While my list, so we know that since my list is a list, we have to modify it. Either we, something that will eventually make sure that our assignment expression will evaluate false. In this case, we are going to be popping, which means we know that eventually it will be zero. It could be anything else, but for now, that's what we are using. However, we are checking if the last item is 3. If it is, we will terminate and leave immediately. So let's run that. So if we run that, what do we do? We are printing the last item. And after we print the last item, we pop it. And we go to the next iteration of the loop. And then we check whether the last item is 3. So what do we expect to happen? We expect to see values up to 4, which is what we have here. So we print 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. When we get to 3, we break. And we can print the list to see what remains. We expect to see 0, 1, 2, 3. And that's exactly what we see. So break will terminate immediately. As before, while also has an else statement. And it the only difference is while with an else behaves like an if. Let's look at an example of that. So while else. I'm only showing this for illustration because it's in the notes. Um, but I would not recommend doing this in, at least for the examples that you're working with. Um, so let's see. So we have i is equal to, 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 to 0, while i is less than 10. Um, hmm, let's actually see what happens. So we're going to print, I will comment this out so that we can see the effect of this. Print i, i. So we have to change i. i, well, it's increasing, so we have to go plus, plus one plus plus two, and then we say else, and we're going to print the else is executed. I don't know what's going to happen here, actually. This is, let's try and see what happens here. 
Okay, so interesting. So it's going to loop, and as long as we so it be, that's the behavior, and that's what the documentation says. The documentation says that the the break statement executed in the first suite terminates a loop without executing the else. So just like with the for, so it behaves just like with the for. Break else will not be executed. Continue it will do whatever continue it needs to do, and then execute the the else statement. So else is executed there. So and we say if. If uh, i is equals to four, let's say break, and we know now the else will not be executed, and that's it. So that's just an example. If you said continue, um, so continue, we say else will be executed, and we break, else will not be executed. So I have to comment this one for, for now, and we see, oh, it doesn't. Wow, you know why? It's because we don't have a decrement, in, an increment in there. So we have to add an increment. I plus two. And that's the else is executed. And if we comment this and comment that, and the else is not executed. So that's just an illustration of what that does. Okay, and I think that brings us to, so we've looked at this example, we continue, this example with break, we've looked at an extra example with um, else, which as I said, it's good to know, but don't strain yourself with, with that. And so let's just do a recap. The key ideas, compound structures have got this structure, header suite. Header determines what will happen with the suite. Um, each of the different constructs have a different header, which affects the suite in different ways. For an if, it will be conditional, and it will only be executed once. For a for, it will be executed as many times as the number of items in the iterator. For a while, provided the assignment expression evaluates to true, it will keep executing the suite. That's the key idea. And we've said, how what is the structure of um, each of the different headers? If has got the literal if with an assignment expression. For has got a literal for with var literal in with an iterator. And while has got literal while with an assignment expression. All of these end with a column. And that's it. So you can test yourself. These are five simple questions on the key ideas try them out when you can maybe i should copy this out so that you can uh, i put it in the chat here so that you can try them out even right now so https bit dot and it's two t a q four m d so try them out just to test yourself make sure you have a good understanding next week we shall be looking at our last, uh, no, I will be looking at functions, which as I said is another compound structure and and functions are a really, really cool way for you to now begin hiding parts of your code away so that your, you can make your code neater and you can reuse that code in different places without having to copy and paste it around. So I think that brings us to the end of this class um, and thank you for watching. And if you have any questions, you could put, put them in the um, questions down below in the comment section at the bottom. Okay, thank you and bye.